we thought it would be a good idea to run a webinar on abstract writing, as we know from experience that authors can often find abstracts the hardest part of the review to write. And this is reflected in the fact that it is often the section of the review that receives most editorial comments. With the switch to the new focused review format earlier this year, there have also been some subtle changes to the abstract. So we thought it would be useful to present the guidance on this simultaneously. And I should point out that the guidance in this webinar applies to an intervention review only. Okay, so I'm just going to give an outline of the webinar. So firstly, I'm going to highlight the reasons why it's so important to write a good abstract. And hopefully that will, um, after this webinar, it'll encourage you to, to take the time to really write a good abstract. Um, I'm going to pick out the key attributes that make a good abstract. I'm going to discuss the reporting standards that your abstract should follow. I'm going to talk about the focused review format and what that means for abstracts. I'm going to discuss the headings and the information that should be populated under each heading. And I'm going to use a well-written abstract as an example for that. And finally, I'm going to finish off with some style tips. So uh, first of all, why is it important to write a good abstract? Well, abstracts of Cochrane reviews are made freely available on the internet. They are also published in bibliographic databases that index the Cochrane database of systematic reviews, such as Medline and Embase. Some readers may be unable to access the full review or the full text may not have been translated into their language. So abstracts may be the only source they have to view the review results. Um, and abstracts are not just for researchers, they are an extremely valuable source of information for healthcare decision makers. And by that, I mean clinicians, consumers and policy makers. So with all the above in mind, it is important that they can be read as a standalone document. OK, I'm now going to pick out the four attributes that we um, think an abstract should be. So first of all, an abstract should be accurate. It should accurately reflect the synthesis of results section and the summary of findings tables. An abstract should be complete. It should convey the review question or questions, the methods used, the results found, and the limitations of the evidence in the review. An abstract should be consistent. It should not contain any information that is not in the main body of the review and the overall messages should be consistent with the conclusions of the review. And finally, an abstract should be short. Um, it shouldn't be more than a thousand words and this is due to the fact that PubMed will only display the first thousand words of an abstract. Um, although in the interest of brevity, authors should aim to include no more than 700 words without sacrificing important content. So I want to acknowledge that hitting these four attributes um, is not easy. We know that condensing vast amounts of information into a short summary version is challenging, particularly if you've got a large or complex review. However, um, if you do, if you follow the guidance, um, you will hopefully end up with an abstract that reads well and makes sense. Okay, so um, Cochrane abstracts should um, adhere to the PRISMA reporting standards, and that's the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And these were endorsed in 2023 to coincide with the switch to the focused review format. And the PRISMA standards were developed by researchers and editors to help people write up their systematic reviews. Um, more information can be found in the link, and I'll also um, provide a link to this at the end of the session. OK, now on to the focused review format. So what is the new format? Well, the aim of the new format is to simplify reporting for greater impact to showcase the integrity of Cochrane evidence. Um, the abstract headings in the focused review format have been updated and they're slightly different from those in the previous format, but not so different that you need to worry. So from April this year, all reviews are now in the focused review format and they include updates which have been switched over. 
So whether you're going to be conducting a new review or updating a review, um, you will be using the new format. And more information can be found in this link, which includes resources, training and webinars on the new format. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the abstract in the previous format. Um, it had six headings, um, background, objectives, search methods, selection criteria, data collection analysis, and author's conclusions. In the new format, um, there are now 12 headings, and that is in line with the format providing more focus. Um, so just to point out that background has changed to rationale, and um, objectives and search methods remain the same. Eligibility criteria was previously inclusion criteria, so there's a subtle change there. Um, we have new headings for outcomes and risk of bias. Uh, synthesis methods was previously data collection and analysis. And we have new headings for included studies, funding and, and registration. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through the different headings for the new abstract, and I'm going to use a well-written abstract as an, ex an example. So we've chosen this abstract, which is on age-related macular degeneration. It was a simple intervention review comparing new drugs with current drugs, and it was published in June this year. Okay, so on to the first heading, which is the rationale. So in this heading, you should provide a concise summary of the rationale for and the context of the review. So this should include a brief description of the evidence base, what is currently unknown or uncertain, and why it is important to resolve this uncertainty within this systematic review. And ideally, it should be two to three sentences. Okay, so... I'm going to refer back to the age-related macular degeneration um, abstract. I'm just going to give you a minute to read the rationale on the screen here. Okay, so hopefully you've all had time to read the rationale that the author has provided. Um, I'm now going to highlight how the rationale hits the key points in the guidance. So first of all, they've highlighted why the condition is important. It's a progressive eye disease, and it's the leading cause of vision loss and disability worldwide. They have provided a description of the evidence base. They've stated that current drugs are known to be effective in preventing vision loss, but they, um, they come with a significant financial burden on patients and healthcare systems. They've also provided a rationale for the review, and that is that the new products have been developed, um, which may help reduce costs. And that highlights that the review is important as the safety of these new drugs needs to be tested. Okay, so on to the objectives of the review. These should include reference to the population under consideration, the health condition, the intervention, and the comparison. And the objective in the abstract should be identical to the objective in the main review. So again, I'm just going to present the example used in the abstract. I'll let you read that. Okay, and I'm just going to pick out the key points and how this has met the PRISMA reporting standards. So authors have identified that they're going to measure both the benefits and the harms. 
they've stated the new drug that they're testing. So that's the, the new agents and the comparison are the reference products. So the, the current drugs that are available and they've clearly stated that the population is people with neovascular age, age-related macular degeneration. Okay, so onto the search methods. Under this heading, you should list the information, information sources, such as the databases and registered registers used to identify the studies. And you should also um, state the date when this last search was conducted. So in the example that I'm using, authors have identified the databases that they checked along with the search date. Um, I should also point out that they've stated that they checked references and co contacted other study authors. This isn't strictly a requirement for the abstract, but if you've done that, then it can be reported here. Okay, on to the heading eligibility criteria which was previously inclusion criteria, but the new heading reflects that um, as well as what you are including in your review, you should also state any important exclusion criteria. So really under this section, you want to state the study types that are included and particular study types that will be excluded. Um, you want to state the participants of interest, again, noting any important exclusions and the interventions and comparators. So um, this is what authors of the age-related macular degeneration review stated as their eligibility criteria. So um, just to pick out the key hit points that they've hit, they've stated that they're going to include randomised control trials only. They've stated the intervention and the comparator. They've specified the participants, so adults 50 years or above. And they've um, specified the health condition. So that's active primary or recurrent neovascularization lesion due to neovascular EMD. So they've gone into quite specific detail under the eligibility criteria there. Okay, on to outcomes. Um, under this heading, you only state the most important outcomes that feature in the summary of findings table. So you do not need to state every outcome listed under the PICO section of your review. Um, so here are the seven outcomes that authors of the abstract um, stated under this heading, and they are the same seven important outcomes that were in their summary of findings table for which they performed grade ratings. Okay, on to the risk of bias heading. Here you want to state the tools that you use to assess the risk of bias. So that could be the original risk of bias one tool, the risk of bias two, Robin's eye, or any other appropriate tools to measure risk of bias. Uh, you also want to report the specific outcomes that you assess the risk of bias for, um, depending on, on what those outcomes were. And you want to highlight that if your review included different study designs, then different risk of bias tools would be applied to those studies. So, for example, um, if you were doing RCTs, you could do ROB1 or ROB2. But if you also included non-randomized studies of interventions, you would state that Robin's Eye or another appropriate tool was used for those studies. So authors of the AMD review um, reported here that they assessed the risk of bias for seven outcomes um, in the summary of findings table using the risk of bias two tool. Um, obviously, this was only an intervention review on RCTs, so uh, they didn't include any non-randomized studies, so they just stuck to the ROB2 tool here. Okay, on to synthesis methods. Uh, this heading should present the methods used to synthesize your results. So you should report the statistical and analysis models used if a meta-analysis was conducted, or if you were not able to conduct a meta-analysis, you would report how you synthesize the data. So you could synthesize uh, using the SWIM methods, or you could just report your results narratively. 
And under this heading, you should also state that you assess the certainty of evidence using the grade approach. So um, this is what authors of the AMD re uh, review said in their abstract. I'll just give you a second to read that. So just to pick out the key points that they've hit there. So they state the effect estimates that they're going to use. So they're going to calculate risk ratios for the dichotomous outcomes, mean differences for the continuous outcomes with the 95% confidence intervals. They also report that they're going to summarize the results narratively if they weren't able to do a meta-analysis. And they have stated that they're going to use CRADE on the outcomes that were specific outcomes that they had listed a priori. Okay, on to the included studies section. Now, the editorial feedback on this heading is that of, authors often fail to report this adequately. So you really want to contextualize your findings here. Um, so first of all, you want to state the total number of included studies and total number, number of participants in the review. You also want to summarize relevant characteristics of studies, and these may include important information um, about the applicability of the included studies. For example, the age of participants, the countries in which the studies were conducted, and any important covariates such as pre-existing conditions or risk factors. And it's important that in your, if your review aimed to look at one population, for example, all age groups, but it only included studies with adolescents, you would want to make readers aware of this in the abstract as that has a direct influence on the applicability of these results. And you want to ensure that what is reported here is consistent with details in the included studies section of the review and the section participant set settings and participant section of your summary of findings tables. So I'll just let you read what the authors of the review wrote for, uh, under their included studies. Okay, hopefully you've all um, had a chance to read that. And again, I'm going to pick out the key points uh, that make this a, a well-written abstract. So firstly, they state the number of studies and the study types. They state the total number of participants, and they also report the sample size from the lowest to the highest. They state the mean age of the participants and the proportion that were female. Um, they talk about the, the state, the most studied intervention and the most studied comparison. They highlight that uh, the, all of the studies were supported by industry, which is important depending on the nature of your review. So if commercial interests could have an influence um, in your review, it would be important to acknowledge this here. Um, they talk about the follow-up time from the lowest to the longest duration and they present the study settings by countries. And they also give an indication of the quality, methodological quality of the included studies. So we thought this was a particularly good example here as it hits all the, all the key characteristics that you would want to know. Okay, on to the synthesis of results heading. So here you want to present the results for the most important outcomes in the summary of findings table. So again, you don't need to report results for all outcomes of the review, just those in their summary of findings tables. 
and you want to indicate the number of included studies and number of participants for each outcome. And if no studies reported the outcome, you should make a note of that in the abstract to make readers aware. So it's important that that is in included. Don't just leave it out because there were no studies. That information has to go in the abstract. If a meta-analysis was done, then you would want to report the summary estimate and the confidence interval. And if you're comparing groups, you want to indicate the direction of the effect, for example, which group is favoured. And this heading should also provide a brief summary of the limitations of the evidence included in the review. And by that, I mean risk of bias, indirectness, imprecision, inconsistency. So the, in other words, the grade ratings there. So again, I'll let you read what the authors wrote under synthesis of results. Okay, so just want to highlight the key points that they've hit here. So they have stated that there's little to no difference in the proportion of participants who experienced a serious ocular adverse event. They've stated the effect estimate, the 95% confidence interval, the number of studies, the number of participants, and the level of the evidence. And this is how it should be um, presented in the abstract. And you can find information on this in the style manual which I'll refer to at the end of the webinar. Um, so the authors have also given a bit more detail about the proportion of participants who experience these adverse events. So they've contextualised the findings and they've also reported the most uh, frequently documented serious adverse events. And this would be particularly useful information for those uh, providing or receiving healthcare because they would, you can imagine they would probably want to know the specific um, side effect that was experienced. Okay, so on to the author's conclusions. Under this heading, you want to provide a general interpretation of the results and also the important implications. You want to avoid making conclusions that are not supported by results. Um, and you want to ensure that the conclusions accurately reflect the synthesis of results section and the summary of findings tables. And um, please avoid making, avoid making recommendations for clinical practice. Um, so again, I'll show you what authors have uh, written for their conclusions. Okay, so again, to pick out the key points here. So um, authors have um, provided a general interpretation of the results, which is reflective of the synthesis of results section and summary of findings tables. Um, so they've, they've stated what they've found um, in terms of benefits and harms. Um, they've talked about the limitations, so that the, these include a limited number of studies, um, another limitation is that the, there's sparse long-term safety data and the quality of life outcomes weren't very frequently assessed. Um, and they have also um, shown 
they've reported what could that the findings could be modified um, because there's currently um, ongoing studies and studies in development, uh, new studies um, in development, so that the findings might change according to what is published. So authors here have been careful not to make conclusions that are not supported by the results, and they've avoided making recommendations for clinical practice. Okay, on to the funding heading. So here you would just report the primary source of funding, and that could be like received as the group doing the work or individually by any author. And under registration, you would want to provide the register name and number and the DOI of previously published protocols and reviews. So for example, um, they give the, the DOI for the protocol here. Okay, I'm now going to finish with some style tips. So we would encourage you to stick to the same sentence structure. And um, unfortunately you can't use bulleted lists and abstracts as PubMed doesn't um, recognize these. Um, but if you, you can group the outcomes or time points together, if you think that it would make the review more readable. You want to use the same abbreviations, terminology and names for outcomes throughout the review, but these should be reasonable to reasonably easy to understand for a general rather than a specialist healthcare audience. You want to try to ensure the results are presented in the same order as the review, um, but if that makes it unreadable, as I say, you can um, do some groupings to make it to make it easier to read. Um, and most importantly, um, keep it simple and just make sure it makes sense. And uh, some more style tips can be found in the Cochrane style manual. I've provided a link here. Um, again, they're all the resources there if anyone needs to see them. Um, uh, thank you very much for listening and I look forward to any questions.